Well, Saints, the last time we were together, we uh, fellowship concerning mainly one verse. Actually, we have we have spent two times already on this one verse, which is First Timothy three fifteen, and today we would like to come back to this same verse for the third time. There's so much in it, and we've just spoken a little bit so far. The first time that we recovered this verse, I believe that we emphasized the matter of life. And I think the second time we emphasized the matter of truth. Well, I would like to tell you that also in this one verse, are some particular descriptions of the church which we do not find elsewhere and these descriptions of the church tell us very much about our christian life and how our christian life should be so uh, let's begin again with reading this familiar verse first timothy 315. But if I delay, I write that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the house of God. So what is what is this verse going to talk about? It's going to talk about how to conduct ourselves in the church, how to what is the kind of behavior? What is the kind of um, demeanor? What is the kind of uh, living that we should have in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and base of the truth? So, as I mentioned, this one um, relatively short verse has two descriptions of the church which are very striking and very meaningful. And we should also remember that the book of First Timothy, actually First and Second Timothy and Titus, these books, were written during the time of the decline and degradation of the church. You might say, well, we're not in such a decline. Whether we are or not, the church in general, God's people on the earth are in a general situation of decline and degradation. That means that whatever is spoken in these few books is, is very, very much for us today. And if we are honest, we would have to admit that even with us, there's a shortage. We pointed this out in the previous sessions, there's a shortage of life. And that shortage of life results in a shortage of oneness and one accord. Whenever there is a lack in the oneness and in the one accord, you can be sure the source of that problem is a shortage of life. It means we have left the tree of life as our source. Likewise, a lack of truth will be a great problem among us. So we, we need to pursue the truth, to know the truth, to continue steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, which is the truth. And that will preserve us very much in a time of degradation and decline. And on the other hand, Departing from the truth 
even a little. A little departure from the truth will result in degradation. And we saw this, that the source of all the degradation, there were eventually, there were many kinds of degradation that came into the church life, but they all had their source in one thing, and that was departing from the teaching and fellowship of the apostles. So in these days, we hope all of us can come back to Christ as the tree of life and Christ as the unique reality, the truth. May life and truth fill our church life. May life and truth be the center of our church life. And if it is saints, then our church life will be in harmony. It will be in oneness and it will be in one accord. Even more, the Lord will have what he needs. We are not talking about the church mainly for our enjoyment and our satisfaction. We're talking about the church to meet God's need. He needs to have the reality of the body of Christ built up in this age. That will only be with those who overcome all kinds of degradation and keep this oneness of the body and the one accord. Okay, I mentioned there are two uh, unique descriptions in this uh, verse. The first is here, Paul calls the church, the church of the living God. Why would he emphasize? Why would he emphasize the word living? Because in a time of degradation, Deadness comes in, spiritual deadness, spiritual lukewarmness. We can see that from the um, seven epistles in Revelation 2 and 3, especially with the church in Sardis. Spiritual deadness comes in, and this is a sure sign of degradation is deadness and we know the signs of spiritual deadness you know one of the signs of physical deadness is that dead people don't speak they don't make any noise and one of the signs of spiritual deadness is dumbness uh, a lack of speaking, a lack of the exercise of the ministry uh, of, of, of our function to build up the organic body of Christ. But we cannot just exhort one another, function, uh, speak. That's, that's not the solution. The solution is life life and truth. If we have life and truth, function will come. So the first key phrase that we should notice in this verse is the living God, the church of the living God. Of course, this phrase, the living God, appears many times in the Bible. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are at least 14 verses that call God the living God. The difference here in Timothy is that the church is described as the church of the living God. Uh, not only so, the phrase the living God is used many times, at least 15 times in the New Testament in many different ways. 
But again, I say here, the emphasis is that the church is the church of the living God. That's unique. That it's not only the house of God. It is the house of the God of God, but it's the house of the living God. Okay, let's read on a little bit and then we'll emphasize some of the the details. The next key phrase after the living God is house and pillar. The church is a house and the church is a pillar. I think we might be a little more familiar with the the, the, the description of the church as a house, but are we familiar with the church as a pillar? But let's begin with the word house. You know, when we talk about our house, we mean the place, the place, the physical place where we dwell, where we live. Right now, because of the pandemic, I am speaking to you, not in the meeting hall, but from my house, from my dwelling place. So that's the basic meaning of the word house. But God's house is unique because God's dwelling place his house is actually his family. Now, I have a family. I have uh, a wife. I have two daughters. And uh, they are my family. But they're not my house. I don't live in them. I live in this, in this physical house. But God, listen to this. God lives in his family. He lives in the members of his family. So, you know, the Old Testament type of that was the nation of Israel. God considered Israel his dwelling place, of course, represented by the tabernacle and later the temple. But actually, God considered his people as his dwelling place even the more in the New Testament. God's dwelling place is not a physical building. Oh, uh, it's so sad. It's so sad that in the degradation of the church, in Christianity today, people would refer to a physical building as the house of God. No physical building is the house of God. So I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church, as many of you were. And my brother and I would go to the Catholic Mass because our parents wanted us to go. But we didn't behave very well. And uh, quite often the ushers would come because we were making noise and they would tell us, they would tell me and my brother, behave yourself in the house of God. Be quiet in the house of God. Well, they meant when they said house of God, they meant that building. They considered that building, that physical building, to be the house of God. God does not dwell in physical buildings. God's dwelling place is man. That's where he wants to live. That's where he wants to dwell. That's where he wants to make his home. That's Ephesians 3.17 that Christ may make his home in your heart. That's where he wants to live. That's where he wants to dwell in the 
inward parts of his people. So the church needs to be his house. That means we, we need to be his house. That means we individually and corporately need to allow him to make his home here. Make his home in us, make his home among us, make his home with us. We want to, we need to be the house of the living God. Now, this verse also uses another word that we are not as familiar with in this way of describing the church he says the the church is the pillar and base of the truth what does it mean to say that the church is a pillar and it's a pillar of the A, um, I would say a somewhat uh, unknown or misunderstood aspect of the church. I mentioned that in the Old Testament, God's dwelling place, his house, uh, in reality was his people. But there was an outward representation of that, which was firstly the tabernacle and later the temple. And if you read the book of First Kings, there's uh, in chapter seven, there's a, a description of the temple. And the emphasis, the emphasis in that description is on two pillars, two big, massive pillars in front of the temple that actually supported the entire structure of God's building. So these, of course, this is the Old Testament type, but let's start there and then we'll come to the New Testament reality. And you know, these two pillars actually had names. That means they're persons, right? Only people have names. Anyway, the name of the first pillar was Jachin. And the, the name Jachin means he will establish. Oh, what a good name. That pillar, the significance of that first pillar, named Jacob, is that God will establish his dwelling place on the earth. Amen. And we're, we're in that establishment right now. It is going on. He is building. You know, for to say he will establish. It's very similar to the Lord saying in Matthew 16, I will build my church. He will establish his dwelling place. Similar meaning. He will establish. Then there was a second pillar uh, matching the first. You know, whenever in the in the Bible you see uh, this number, two, two refers to a, a testimony. It is a, it is a testimony. It's not just one, it's two. That signifies a testimony. The name of that second pillar was Boaz. And the name Boaz means in him is strength. Uh, you know, I had I had 
my wife and I had two daughters, but today if I had two sons, I would like to name them Jaken and Boaz. I think that would be wonderful. Jacob means he will establish. And Boaz means in him is the strength, all of the strength, all of the ability, all of the power to accomplish that. He, he has the intention to do it, and he has the strength to do it a kind of a prophecy isn't it and it's a kind of a testimony those two pillars stand in front of god's dwelling place as a kind of testimony that god is living if he were not living he has no strength to carry out what he intends to do no, he, this is a testimony he will establish. And he has the strength to establish. Why? Because he is the living God. He will do it. Now, let's go on because the New Testament interpretation of these pillars is very interesting. First, in First Timothy 3.15, it tells us the pillar is a pillar of the truth. A pillar of the truth. And a base. The pillar, it says that it, the pillar and the base are equal. That's why we're not talking about the base as something separate from the pillar. The pillar is the base. So this pillar in the new testament is the base the support of the truth well this word truth is a deep word and we we need to consider it carefully we'll we'll come back to the word truth in a minute uh because it's it's crucial Let's fellowship a little bit more about the house of the living God. Um, you know, if you visit the house of a living person, everything will be orderly. Behind me, you see a lot of books. What if the books were just all over the place? laying on the ground and completely in disorder and you come into my house you'll wonder does a does is this the house of a living person does somebody does somebody actually live in this house because the house of a living person will will testify that the the dweller of this house is living, is living. Well, what's the meaning of that? Brothers and sisters, it means that you and I must be a testimony. We must be the testimony that God is living because we are his house. When people see our living, when they see our conduct, they should see that God is living. That's what they should take away from their contact with us. Their observation of our living and our conduct should be, oh, whoever these people are, their God is living uh, again we can use an old testament type of this um, especially i'm impressed by the book of daniel you know, daniel and his companions they lived a life 
that testified that God was living. Even though they were under the king in a foreign place, in a place of captivity, they answered to a living God. They prayed to a living God. And I would never say that they were rebellious against the king, but I would say that they, their living testified that their real ruler, their real king was the living God. And in Daniel chapter 6, you have a very, very specific instance of such a testimony. Uh, you know, uh, by this time, Darius was the king. And, um, you know, during that time of captivity, there was a, a succession of kings in Babylon. At the time of Daniel 6, it was Darius, and Darius had to um, uh, uh, carry out a sentence against Daniel. So he had Daniel thrown into the lion's den, or the king put Daniel into the lion's den and it seems like it seems like the king was a little conflicted about this so in daniel 6:20 he says this and when he had come near the den he shouted to daniel with a sad voice the king responded and said to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Listen, this is the king of Babylon. The king of Babylon calls Daniel servant of the living God. He saw in Daniel's living, he saw in Daniel's conduct, he saw in Daniel's behavior a testimony that the God of this person, Daniel, is a living God. There's no way that this man, Daniel, serves dumb idols. No. He is a servant of the living God. Well, then the king, so the king asked this question, was your God able to deliver you? And of course, the answer was yes. God, God, the living God did, did deliver Daniel from the den of lions. So a few verses later in verse 26, listen to what the king said again. I make a decree that in all the dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and enduring forever. And his kingdom, is one which will not be destroyed and his dominion will be unto the end oh i like this i like this term the, the king called god the god of daniel he called him the living god and he called him the god of daniel means daniel's god is a living God. May we all have such a testimony, saints, at our, at our school, at our job, in our family, uh, among our relatives, among our friends. May they say, 
oh, the God of this person is a living God. That should be our testimony. That's for the, that is what it means for the church to be the house of the living God. And the king went on to say that this living God endures forever and his kingdom goes on forever. I mentioned that there was a succession of, of kings in Babylon during the, 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 the period of time recorded in the book of Daniel. No doubt Darius knew the, the previous kings expired and their kingdoms ended. But there's another, there's another king. There's another God who is the God of Daniel. He doesn't expire. He never dies. And his kingdom never ends. That should be our testimony, saints. That's what the people of the world should see. Babylon signifies the world, both the religious aspect of the world and the material aspect of the world. In Revelation uh, 18, you can see this. Uh, and that's what the world should see with us. And that's what religion should see with us. The worldly people should see that our God is a living God. Let's apply this a little bit, okay? I, I want to make this more practical. Today, the whole earth is under a very severe pandemic. Um, there hasn't been a pandemic like this in about a hundred years. It's certainly the first one in in my lifetime, uh, there's never been a pandemic like this in my lifetime. And I would say for most of us, that's true because most of us are not a hundred years old, right? And then on top of this health pandemic, this terrible <clears throat> disease on top of that, there's a financial crisis, a worldwide financial crisis um, brought on, brought on by the pandemic. Is that all? No. Then on top of that, there's a social crisis and a political crisis brought on by both the pandemic and the financial crisis. I, I, you know, the world is always in chaos. I expect that. But this is a very, very high degree of chaos, isn't it? I've never seen anything quite like it. And it's everywhere. It seems that it affects the entire earth. How are the people in the world reacting? How are they responding? How, how, what are they saying? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I think you know. They're utterly perplexed. They're utterly filled with anxiety. They're afraid. They wonder. Is this the end? Is the end of the world coming? Well, the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> the end of the world is most certainly coming. But my point is the anxiety of the people in the world is higher than ever before. What if they could see a people. What if the people of the world could observe a people who are not anxious? I'm not anxious about this virus. 
I'm not anxious about my health. I am not anxious about my finances. Why? Because I serve a living God. If my God were not living, I'd be anxious too. Or if I did not believe, I would be very anxious. Well, how about the believers? Oh, brothers and sisters, even as believers in Christ, if we do not enjoy God as the living God, if we, and even the more, if we do not contact God as the living God, we'll be anxious. You know, one of the outstanding characteristics of Daniel, I think all of us who have read the book of Daniel would agree, an outstanding characteristic of this man, Daniel, and his companions, is that he prayed. He prayed. This was a person who contacted God. He contacted God in a living way. His contact with God was not religious. It was not formal. He didn't just pray as a kind of a form. No, he prayed in such a way that the living God became the testimony in his living. May it be this way with us saints. Um, like I said, it's not only the worldly people who are anxious. I read an article recently, you know, during this pandemic. Um, well, the first thing the article said is very good. It said that uh, the sale of the Bible all over the earth is higher than at any time in history. This tells you something. People, people know, even the unbelievers know. Something is going on. It has to do with God, and it has to do with the end of the age. So now they're going to find out. Is, does the Bible talk about this? Yeah, yes, it does. Yes, it does. But this article also said, uh, the title was, Where is God? Where is God? In the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of this financial crisis, where is God? In other words, it's somewhat, somewhat an accusation against God. Why is God not doing something to stop the pandemic? Why is he not doing something to preserve human life? Why doesn't he intervene? Well, that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But let me just say briefly, where is God? He's behind everything. He is in everything. Just because you don't see him doesn't mean he's not active. He's exceedingly active. He is operating, giving mankind an opportunity to repent, to believe in him, to be saved before the end of this age. This, this kind of world situation is, is the Lord's mercy. It's not the Lord's judgment, and it is not the Lord neglecting the human race. No, it is God's love and mercy toward the human race. Well, anyway, you get my point. Whether you are an unbeliever, whether you are a believer, a situation like the one we are in today is a big test. Big test. Do you have a living God? 
I, we would all say, yes, our God is living. We even have a song, our God is living. Say hallelujah. Okay. If he's living, why are you so anxious about the world situation? If we really serve a living God, the world will see our testimony. We're not anxious. We're not responding to this the way they are because we're at peace. We have a living God. Okay, that's just a little illustration of what we mean by serving a living God. If, if I go into the lion's den, the living God will be with me in the lion's den. It's, Daniel was like Paul in Philippians. It's okay if you put me in prison, I'm fine. If I'm out of prison, that's, that's okay. If I'm in prison, that's okay. It's all the same because if I'm in prison or out of prison, I've learned the secret. I love this phrase that Paul spoke in uh, Philippians uh, 4. I learned the secret that in whatever circumstances I am to be content, I'm content. There's a pandemic. I'm still content. The pandemic ends, I'm still content. There's another pandemic, I'll be content again. Why? I learned the secret. Well, with Daniel, the secret was the living God. And with Paul, the secret was also this living God embodied in Christ as the spirit. And he said, I can do, this is Paul's testimony. I can do all things in him, in the one who empowers me. So even when Paul was in prison, I think you know this, even when Paul was in prison, he was living Christ and he was magnifying Christ. You know, I've always found it very interesting that when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he never asked the believers to pray for his release from prison. I think if I was in prison, I would say, uh, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, please pray. Please pray that I could be released from prison so that I could be with all the saints. Paul never asked them to do that. He said, pray for me that while I am in prison, I will live Christ and magnify Christ by the bountiful supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ in the body, I'll live Christ. It's okay if I'm in prison, as long as I live and magnify Christ. Well, what happened? Even the guards, even the guards in the prison, saw that Paul's God was living. He was just like Daniel. So you know some of the some of the guards were persuaded to receive Christ through the testimony of Paul. That's what it means to be the house of the living God. Our being are living in any kind of circumstances testifies we don't serve a dead god 
We serve a living God. Yes, he's invisible. That's why people say, where is he? He's invisible. That doesn't make him less living. He's just... <laughs> He's just living in an invisible way. Okay, we should go on now. Let's go on to this other word, the word truth. The, the church is the house of the living God. And the church is the pillar and base of the truth. So we have emphasized the word living we have talked about how the living God is testified in our life as the church. Now, what does it mean for the church to be the pillar and base of the truth? You know, the word truth, it's a common word. It's a simple word, isn't it? In English, it's just so short. And it's used many, many, many times in the Bible. But I would say again, it's not very well understood. Most of the time when we talk about truth, we think about teaching or uh, doctrine Maybe the scriptures, which is not wrong, but that's a, a shallow understanding of the truth, and it's only one aspect of the truth. In in Greek, the language of the New Testament, the word truth, aletheia, means reality. Yes, you you also can translate it as truth, but it 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 has a deeper meaning, which is reality. It's the real things in the universe, starting with the word of God and God himself. And in John 1.17, the word truth is used in contrast to the law. And truth and grace are paired together in this verse. Let me read to you. I'll start with verse 14. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and reality. For of his fullness, we have all received and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and reality came through Jesus Christ. You know, grace and reality are both personified in Jesus Christ. He is the reality. He is the truth. That's what he said in John 14. I am the way. I am the reality or the truth. I am the life. So when you have Christ, you have grace. When you have Christ, you have truth. So when we say that the, the church is the pillar, the testimony, the base of the truth, we're not saying that the church is the pillar of correct scriptural teachings and the testimony of correct teachings. No, we're saying the church is the testimony of Christ as the reality in the universe. That's what we're saying. Have you got it? Okay, I go on. In the Old Testament, you have the law. I told you John 1.17 contrast truth with the law. Well, the law in the Old Testament is like a photograph or a picture of the New Testament reality, which is Christ. Today, you are looking at a, 
a digital image of me. It's not really me. It's not the reality. You're just seeing a digital image of me. If I could come to Malabon, you would see the reality. But sorry, I can't come right now. Well, the Old Testament is the, is the picture. The reality of that is Christ. Christ is the reality of every positive thing in the universe. Every positive thing. So, you know, you read uh, especially Colossians chapter 2. It gives examples of things in the physical life which are shadows. This is the word that, that Paul uses in um, Colossians 2. They're shadows. It's like I have a body and the light shines on me, this real person, and behind me, there's a shadow. The shadow is not the reality. The person is the reality. The shadow just tells you there is such a reality. Am I right? Well, all the positive things in the universe are shadows <clears throat> telling us there's a reality of this positive thing, and that reality is Christ. So, for example, I read to you Colossians 2.16. Let no one therefore judge you in eating and drinking or in respect of a feast or of a new moon or of the Sabbath, which are a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. Wow, oh, that's quite a few things there. Food is a shadow. You know, God created human beings in such a way that we need to eat. And he also created us in such a way that eating is a real enjoyment to us. Well, did you know that eating is a shadow? And that the real food is Christ? And the real enjoyment is Christ. Same with drinking, same with a feast or a new moon or a Sabbath. They are all shadows of things to come. But the body, the reality of that shadow is Christ. It's wonderful. Okay, um, let me go on. This means that... Not only should our living testify that God is living, our living should testify that Christ is the reality of all positive things. Oh, brothers and sisters, for this, we need a church life that is not formal. It's not religious. It's not legal. It's full of Christ. It's an exhibition of Christ as the reality. It should be that when people come among us, like it says in 1 Corinthians 14, if they come into our prophesying meeting, they should say, when they observe the prophesying of the saints, they should say, surely God is among these people. God is real. Christ is real. So this should be the other part of our testimony. We, t we testify that God is living. We testify that God is real. Now, let me just say, uh, 
something more about the truth. Uh, one, one on the negative side and, and one on the positive side from these books of first and second Timothy. Uh, there's a striking word in, in both books, first and second Timothy. Paul talks about, uh, some of the saints. You have to understand this is not a word spoken about unbelievers. This is a word spoken about believers. Some of them miss aim concerning the truth. They miss aim. It's like you're going to shoot at a target, but they, they miss aim. They miss aim. So they don't hit the target. They, they hit something else. I just read to you a few of the verses. Um, he said, which things some having misaimed have turned aside to vain talking, desiring to be teachers of the law. So instead of teaching Christ as the reality, they taught the law, which was the shadow. I read another verse, at the same time, they also learn to be idle, going around from house to house. They're not only idle, but gossips and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. Terrible. That's the wrong kind of speaking. That's the wrong kind of testimony. Okay, I go on. If anyone teaches different things and does not consent to healthy words, I like this word, healthy words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching which is according to godliness, he is blinded with pride, understanding nothing, but is diseased with questionings and contentions of words see this is this is what happens when we depart from christ as the reality questions contentions suspicions well i won't read on there's a lot of verses i i what i'm trying to show you is that in first and second timothy there's a line of this kind of wrong speaking. It's a misaiming. It is speaking, it's even speaking about the things concerning God and the things concerning the scriptures, but it misaims. And, and what's the target? What's the target that, that, that all of our speaking should aim at? God's new testament economy christ as our life christ as the reality that's the target don't get involved with questionings contentions suspicions paul uses all these words perpetual wranglings of men corrupted in mind and deprived of the truth. One more, but avoid profane, vain babblings, for they will advance to more ungodliness and their word will spread like gangrene of whom are Hymenaeus and Philetus. That kind of misaiming, that kind of wrong speaking will bring the saints into spiritual death. It will cause gangrene, spiritual gangrene. And uh, the healthy words will cause the saints to be living. So there's a relationship here between the truth and life. 
when we have the proper speaking of the truth, we have life. Now, brothers and sisters, let's end with this on a positive note. In the time of degradation, in the time of decline, what we need to do, the way to correct anything unhealthy, take in the healthy words. That's the way. And it's only in Second Timothy that we have this amazing expression. It's in Second Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God breathed. Oh my goodness. What a word. And you know, if you if you look at the, the Greek word there, that is a literal translation of the Greek word. It's Theo, which is God, Neustos, which is breathed. So God breathed out his word as the breath of life. Like, like in John chapter 20, he breathed into the disciples and spoke. He spoke something. His speaking was his breathing. His breathing was his speaking. And he told them, receive the Holy Spirit. So through his breathing out of the word, they received the spirit as the reality of that word. Can you see this? That's the way. That's the way we can be saved from death. That's the way we can be saved from degradation. Brothers and sisters, we need to breathe in the word all the time. And it's significant that he uses the word breathe. You know, we we can go quite a long time without eating. You know, the word, we also need to eat the word. We also need to drink in the spirit in the word. You can go a long time without eating. And you can go a shorter time without drinking. You can't go very long without breathing. I don't know what the world record is. But I think, you know, only a few minutes. After a few minutes of not breathing, it's all over. <laughs> the word of God is our food. The word of God is our drink. The word of God is our breath, our air. Because the spirit is the reality of that word. Every day, especially in the morning, we must take in this healthy word. So that we'll have a testimony in our living. And that the church will be the house of the living God. The church will be the pillar and base of the truth. Okay, one last uh, small point, and that is, um, you know, Timothy and Titus were um, Paul's spiritual children. We know, according to history and according to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul did, did not marry. He did not have children. But he had spiritual children, and two of his spiritual children were Timothy and Titus. And in these three books, First and Second Timothy and Titus, you can find a lot of words that I would call them fatherly exhortations. You know, one of the functions of a father is to exhort. The, the, the mother mainly nourishes and cherishes, but the father needs to exhort. He, he needs to give some 
some charges, some instructions. So you will find this word very often in First Tim and Second Timothy and Titus. He says, I charge you, I charge you. And sometimes he makes it even more serious. And he says, I solemnly charge you. Mm -hmm. If your spiritual father says to you, I solemnly charge you, that's serious. I just wrote down a few. I actually came up. You can try it. See what you come up with. I, I went through these three books. I came up with 42 different charges that Paul gave to Timothy and Titus. I'll just give you, don't worry, I won't give you 42. I'll just, I'll just give you a few. Number one, flee, flee. That's a charge. That is a charge. Flee youthful lusts in 2 Timothy 2.22. Uh, number two, be a pattern. Be a pattern. That's a charge. That's in 1 Timothy 4.12. Number three, keep the commandment. 1 Timothy 6.14. Number four, exercise unto godliness. It's an exhortation. Exercise, brothers and sisters, exercise unto godliness. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Number five, refuse foolish questions. It's a charge. We have to learn how to refuse. Not every question is good. Just because someone has a question doesn't mean that it's good. There is such a thing as foolish questions. That's 2 Timothy 2.23. Okay, one more in 1 Timothy 6.12. Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Another, another kind of charge, another kind of exhortation. So my brothers and sisters, this is, this is how we are supposed to conduct ourselves in the church. We're supposed to conduct ourselves as the house of the living God, the testimony that our God is a living God. And the pillar and base of the truth, the testimony that our God is real and he is the unique reality in the universe. And we can practice this, we can live this by taking in the Word of God. The Word of God is the container of life and truth. If we touch the Word of God in a proper way, we'll get life and truth in order for the church to be a testimony of life and truth. The Lord be with you, my brothers, and uh, may he work out all that he has released to us. I'll stop here.